Well, good morning, everybody, and a very warm welcome to our service this morning. We're so glad that you're here with us. If I haven't met you yet, my name is Jess. I'm on a placement here for a few weeks, and I've been really enjoying getting to know lots of you over the last week. But if I haven't met you yet, I'd love to meet you after the service. So please do come and introduce yourself. Um, and I'll be leading our service this morning. So yeah, we're really glad to see you, really glad that you could be here. I've got a few notices to share with you. The first one is about a garden party that's happening at the Vicarage. That's on the 8th of July at 10 o'clock till 12 noon and you're so welcome to come along to that but you do need to let Matt or Jess know if you would like to be there. And the other notice is about next Sunday when we will be having some baptisms here at the 10.30 service. It's going to be really exciting to celebrate with those being baptized. So do come along to that and we're going to have some drinks afterwards to celebrate. And then after that, we're going to go down to the park. So do bring a picnic and a picnic blanket and we'll be celebrating together like that next Sunday. So we would love to have you there. Shall we have a moment of quiet as we welcome Holy Spirit in this place? Holy Spirit, we welcome you here. We say that you are welcome in our hearts and we're ready to meet with you. And in this moment, as we connect with our God, I just invite you to bring before the Lord in your mind the things that this week have brought you some joy. And perhaps you might want to bring before God too the things that have been hard this week, the things that have been sorrowful for you. And in a moment of confession, shall we bring before the Lord the things that we feel we, uh, we've said or done this week or maybe not said or not done, the ways in which we haven't honored God? One John one nine says that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us and purify us from all unrighteousness. And we just praise you, Father, this morning that you're here with us and that you are faithful and just as we sang outside. We thank, thank you that we can trust you, that you're a forgiving God, that we are forgiven in you. We pray this morning that we would glorify you, that we would lift your name high in this place. Be with us and meet us in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Gracious Father, by the obedience of Jesus, you brought salvation to our wayward world. Draw us into harmony with your will that we may find all things restored in him, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to have our gospel reading, and as a way of marking the significance of these words to us, can I invite you to stand? We're going to be reading from Mark chapter 5, beginning at verse 21 to the end. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. So Mark chapter 5, beginning at verse 21. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered round him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed round him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. 
He turned round in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they, when they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and began to, began to walk around. She was 12, 12 years old. At this they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Do take a seat. Two amazing stories of healing in that passage, aren't they? I love those, those stories and the way that just one touch from Jesus, one touch is enough to be transformed. And Jesus really does answer prayer in these two stories of healings. Jesus answers the pleas of Jairus and lives are drastically transformed. And we're going to have our intercessions now. And I just want to encourage you that when we pray, Jesus listens and he does answer prayer. So we want to believe that as we pray, don't we? As we pray for people in our world and in our lives. So let's pray. And when I say, Lord, in your mercy, please respond with, hear our prayer. Loving Father, we thank you so much for the gift that it is to be able to meet together and worship you safely and in person. Thank you for this building and this community in which we can gather as your church. We pray this morning for all those who are unable to be here and we ask that you'd be with them and comfort them. We pray also for all of those in our lives who aren't with us in church because they don't yet know you, Jesus. We pray that you would use us to show your love to all of those around us, but especially those who don't have a relationship with you. We pray that they would come to know you, our God. I'm just going to leave a space now. And if you want to say out loud the name of somebody on your mind who isn't here with you because they don't yet know God, then feel free to do that in this space. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we thank you for the way that you sustain us and provide for us each day. Thank you for the way that you care deeply about the needs of each one of us and for your loving kindness towards us. We know that you are disturbed by the suffering of your people. And we lift to you this morning all those that we know who are struggling in some way. We lift up those who are lonely, ill, grieving or in pain. Father, we ask that you would be their comfort and their strength. We pray for healing for those who are unwell and we pray for your comfort for those who mourn. Father, would you fill them each with your spirit that they might know the comfort of your love in the things they face. And again, I'll just leave a space for you to say or think of anyone who you know who is struggling. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
And Father, we thank you for the relative safety and security that we have here in this country. We recognize the privilege that we live in compared with others around the world. We lift to you the many countries who do not yet have access to resources and vaccines to combat COVID-19. We also lift to you places around the world which are filled with conflict, violence and poverty. Again, we cry out to you, God. We ask for your mercy and your healing hand to be upon these places and the people in them. Would you bring change, resources and funding where it's needed? We ask for your help, Lord God, in the places where it feels we are helpless. And again, just feel free to think of any places that you know of that are struggling at the moment. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Shall we draw our prayers together in the words of the Lord's Prayer? As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Amen. I'll hand over to Matt now. Hello again, everybody, and uh, welcome to anyone who's catching up uh, online later on uh, as well. It's great to have you uh, joining us. Uh, we are continuing our series, uh, picking up some of the Exodus story, and we've been kind of comparing and contrasting the story of God bringing his people out of slavery in Egypt and towards the promised land, uh, and looking at what we can learn as we, uh, as a church, both locally and, and nationally, emerge from from this pandemic and kind of into this new landscape that we're in that is ever-changing and how do we figure out what life needs to look like in it. So last week Rebbe was speaking on the the Passover, the final one of the plagues and the need for God's people to be ready to embrace the freedom that God was making possible. This morning we're skipping ahead a little bit to chapters 16 and 17 and what's happened in the meantime is this that uh, the journey God's people have been on has not been smooth. Uh, God's taken them on a very circuitous route, not the one they would have chosen for themselves. They found themselves being attacked by enemies. Uh, and because of the route that they're on, they're struggling for supplies and food and water are in short supply. So God's people have been rescued from generational slavery under Pharaoh in Egypt. Uh, and it was a miraculous rescue. There were all of the plagues uh, ending with the, the Passover. God then brought them out through an ocean. He parted the waters for them to walk through that they might be free. And so these are, these are a group of people who have every reason to believe and to trust in the Lord, to have confidence in God's ability to save. And we'd expect them to have huge levels of faith. Just imagine if we'd seen some of those things. But this morning we meet them at two moments, one where food is running low and the second where water has run out. And they're, they're in this kind of harsh wilderness. And instead of trusting the Lord, rooted in kind of gratitude for everything that God has already done for them, instead they choose grumbling, rooted in a, in a fear and a, a lack of control. It's what some people have called functional atheism where people kind of proclaim and declare a faith in God with their, with their lips, but then with their lives, they, they function as though they were an atheist, as though they didn't believe there was a God at all. Kind of living in fear and anxiety and worry that comes from depending on ourselves rather than trusting in the God who promises to provide. And it's the same challenge that we face ourselves. We face that same choice between grumbling and gratitude. Now let me be clear, when I'm talking about grumbling, I don't, mean, I don't mean lament or disappointment or being upset, as many of us will have been or might be even this morning. 
I also don't mean criticism and disagreement. The Bible is packed with godly people who express all of those things to God, saying, God, I'm scared. God, I'm, I'm hurt. God, I'm upset. I wish this thing was different. God, will you step in and make a difference? There are godly ways to express our hurts and our disappointments. But grumbling is different to those. Grumbling isn't a humble cry to God for help. Grumbling is like saying to God, you're not doing it right and I could run this show better than you. I know better than you and I'm going to go it alone. I'm going to do it my own way and take back control. So with all of that in mind, we're going to look at Exodus 16. So you might want to turn to Exodus 16 and we're just going to look at the first five verses. Exodus 16, 1 to 5. This is one month after the Exodus has actually happened from Egypt, one month after they've passed through the sea, and they're in this terrain that is rugged and harsh. Exodus 16, verse 1. The whole Israelite community set out from Elim and came to the desert of Sin. Uh, Now, this isn't sin as in doing things wrong or against God's will. This is sin relating to the name Sinai. It's just the desert that was nearby. They came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai. On the 15th day of the second month, after they had come out of Egypt, in the desert the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat round pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted, but you have brought us into this desert to starve the entire assembly to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day they are to prepare what they bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So God's people are in the wilderness and they're running out of food. Now that is a serious issue for them. There's no Tesco Express they can pop to to pick up another loaf of bread. If they're out of food in the desert, it is a life or death scenario. And based on the miraculous way God has freed them from Egypt, we know what their response should be at this point. They've got no reason to think that God isn't going to show up and save them yet again. But they grumble the whole community grumbles. And there's three things that their grumbling does. Firstly, grumbling distorts the past. If you look, it says, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt, because there we sat around pots of meat and we had all the food that we wanted. And they're looking back with these kind of rose-tinted glasses. But, But hang on a minute, if we go back to what they were actually saying at that point... Exodus 2.23 says this, it says they were, singing, uh, they, were, they, you know, they were singing a very different tune, that during those days the king of Egypt died and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and they cried out to God for help. When they, they, when they were sat around those pots of meat and they had all that food, they were desperate to get out of slavery, desperate to be out of Egypt. And now they've been set free, but as soon as things get tricky, they want to go back. Grumbling distorts the past, and and so they're convinced that they were better off before, and they'd rather return to slavery than face this current challenge. And I wonder, don't we do this sometimes as well? God has brought us out of slavery to sin into a place of freedom, but when that freedom doesn't look the way we think it should, we want to go back. And sometimes in our grumbling, we convince ourselves that we could have done better ourselves, we could go it alone better than with God. The second thing grumbling does is it exaggerates the present. So verse 3 again in chapter 16, back in Egypt we ate all the food we wanted, but you have brought us out into this desert to starve the entire assembly to death. And don't get me wrong, they're in a tough spot, but if we check the next chapter, verse 3 of chapter 17, and we'll, we'll mention this briefly in a moment as well, but This time they're quarrelling about the lack of water. And as they're quarrelling and grumbling, they say, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and our livestock die of thirst? 
So even though they're hungry and their food supplies are running low, there's still a people who are carrying this trail of livestock with them, and so they do have some options still left. Grumbling exaggerates the present. It's like when children grumble to their parents and they might say to me, Dad, I'm starving. Well, son, I think you'll find you're not actually starving. There are people around the world who who are starving, but you're not one of them. You're maybe just hangry, or it's been a long time since breakfast, or you were up super early this morning. Grumbling exaggerates the present. And then, so grumbling distorts the past, it exaggerates the present, and then grumbling dishonors God, and this is the crucial point. The real issue with grumbling is that when we grumble, we're saying to God, I don't trust you, God, to come through for me in this situation. I don't believe that God is good enough or or that he's big enough or cares enough to to sort this situation out. And, And so we wrestle back control and try and sort things for ourselves. So grumbling is the issue here rather than gratitude. And once again, we see that God, rather than responding in in wrath and righteous anger towards his people rather than kind of being frustrated with them God just as he did with Pharaoh giving Pharaoh chance after chance after chance God here shows his people mercy he gives them bread from heaven manna for them to eat and the rest of chapter 16 if you want to read it later is just God giving them instructions for how to collect the manna in and make use of his provision Uh, sensibly. And then in verse uh, verse 4, before he kind of sets out the details, he says, uh, in this way I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. I'll test them and see whether they'll follow my instructions. Now, I don't think it's, it's literally kind of about can they follow the directions they've been given. It's more about seeing are their hearts inclined to follow the Lord? Are their hearts inclined towards being God's people? And again, the same question for us. Will we follow God when God's way differs from ours? Will we trust God with our lives? Now, with the manna, they're, in, they're, they're instructed to take enough for each day, just to gather one portion each day, not too much, not too little, just what they need for that day. And if there's any that one on? Great. If there's any left over at the end of the day, then it rots before the next morning comes. Why did God set it up that way? Well, because God wanted them to go out the next day and trust that there would be manna waiting for them again, to trust that God would provide for the next day and the next day and the next. God is trying to teach his people a new way of understanding and relying on his provision, that they would have to trust him each day for the things that they need. I think it's a lesson we need to take hold of as a church as we come through this season together. The landscape around us is changing all the time. It's changing because of all the COVID stuff where the restrictions are kind of gradually changing and up and down each week and we're having to constantly check what we can and can't do. But but it's also changing more broadly than that. The culture and the pace of the change in our culture is accelerating all the time. And so the things that we've always done aren't necessarily going to be the things that we need to do. And the things that we do tomorrow might not be the right things for the day after that. If we're going to authentically live out the gospel and be good news, then we're going to need to trust God every day for the things that we need to do that. God is teaching his people to trust his provision each day. Now, their culture was was different to ours. I know we do have agriculture um, still, but, but not necessarily in the middle of Wolverhampton. Their society was almost entirely agricultural. It was based around the crop cycles. So when the crops were ready, you would go out and you would harvest them all in and you'd store them up safely, knowing that those crops would need to see you and your family through until the next crop was ready for harvest. Because crops don't grow new every day. 
And yet here God is teaching them a new thing and saying to them, go out and gather just enough for today. And then tomorrow, go and do the same. And the same the day after that. And they wrestle, as we see all the way through the story of God's people, they wrestle and struggle between fear and faith, between grumbling and gratitude. Are they going to believe in God's promises to provide, or are they going to believe that their way is best, that it's up to them to make it happen? And you know, God provides this food for them all the years that they spend in the wilderness. He constantly gives them all that they need to flourish. No matter how bleak it looks, God is faithful to provide for them. And it's about way more than just food. Later on, when Moses is reflecting back on this time in the wilderness, this is what he says in Deuteronomy 8, verses 2 and 3. You shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, manna which you didn't know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone. The God who is worthy to be trusted for bread is worthy to be trusted. The God who is worthy to be trusted for bread is worthy to be trusted. God isn't just filling their stomachs each day. He is shaping their hearts. He's teaching them that he is their God and they are his people and he will come through for them every single time. Every single person, in fact. God provides a portion a day for each and every individual in this community. So great is his care for us. They had to trust God for it but they also came to know God's love in it. And it's such a key thing for God's people that it's even uh, referenced by the, by the Gospels as well. So in John chapter 6, we get these words, Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave, uh, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, Truly I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. And so at the end of each day, God's people in the wilderness, as the leftover crumbs begin to rot, they're faced and confronted with that same question. Will you trust him for tomorrow? Will you trust him for tomorrow? The question in the harsh times and in that harsh environment is not what will God's people do to survive? And I think there's a real danger that the church as a whole is slipping into that being the question. What will we do to survive? When really the question God is posing here is, are your hearts inclined to follow me? Are you inclined to trust me for tomorrow? Do you believe that I am enough and I have everything you need? Will we trust God for tomorrow? Well, just very briefly, uh, in Exodus 17, the start of the next chapter, we see Israel facing a very similar situation, and this time they've run out of water. Once again, we see that they go to grumbling rather than gratitude and relying on God's promises. And yet again, we see that God responds not with wrath or anger, but with mercy. And this time what he does is he tells Moses to take the staff and to strike the rock to make the spring of water kind of bubble up and become freely available for all the people. Let me put that another way. In his mercy, God chooses to strike the rock and not his people. He chooses to strike the rock and not his people. And it's pointing us forward to what Jesus would do as he took our place on the cross and he was stricken for us that we need not be. 1 Corinthians 10 puts it this way, For I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all drank the same spiritual drink 
For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. All along, God is pointing forward to the provision he has made for us in Jesus. And in his life, death, and resurrection, the freedom that Jesus has won for us. So I believe that this morning, God is asking us that question, will you follow me when my way differs from yours? Will you follow me when my way differs from yours? Jesus taught that following him involves dying and denying. Dying to ourselves and denying our own wants and desires because we know and we come to trust that what we find on the road with Jesus is better by far than anything else. So will we surrender control and trust in God's provision? Will we trust in God for all we need tomorrow? It's a challenge, it's a tough question, but it is also an invitation and it's an invitation that comes to us, not out of God's anger or frustration with us, but out of his mercy that he longs for us to know the best life possible. He longs for us to know the freedom that he has won for us. So that's the invitation this morning. Will we trust in God? Will we follow him when his way differs from ours? I just want to give us some space to to ponder that and to respond in our own way. I'm going to sing a a song, that, that, that the chorus of which is about waiting on the Lord. That sense of, Lord, we'll we'll wait on you and your promises. We'll choose to trust you. Even when it doesn't necessarily make sense or stack up in our minds, we will choose to wait on you. And so I invite you to to use this uh, this space to pray, to do business with God, to follow along with the words on the screen if that's helpful for you. Let's uh, respond together. coming through.
choose to trust in your faithful provision we choose to look to you as the one who who provides us with all that we need both in our, our individual walk with you in our day-to-day -day lives but for us as a church God that you are all we need and we choose to trust in you Jesus Amen and I'll hand us back to Jess We're going to say the creed together, so if you're able, would you like to stand? And let's declare our faith in God. We believe in God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Do take your seats for our final blessing. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us always. Amen.